pickpockets across Ireland are roaming our streets seven days a week. Sometimes you have to do a twice a day. Whether working alone or within a group, these professionals are preying on people in unlikely places. Dressing rooms is perfect. There's a gap in between the two aisles of the dressing room. Throughout this programme, we gain an insight into where they work. Just in town late at night, women coming out of pubs are often really vulnerable. Most of the time I would do it in shops, pubs and shops. How they operate. I have got pretty violent. A woman I'd swung into a wall and basically knocked her out. And who they target. Mainly tourists, middle-aged women. The older the better. The older women don't seem to scream as much. Women more so. Just give her a slap. She'll fall and free. She'll fall to the ground in terror. Magician Brian Daly pickpockets through entertainment. He learned his craft through research and observation. I got interested in pickpocketing by um, seeing documentaries and things like that, and I noticed they were using the same principles as a magician. So they can misdirect someone, they can divert their attention and distract them. And I said I could, I could employ that in magic when I'm getting close to people and interacting with them during a, during a trick. The way most people get involved in it is through either feeding a drug habit or feeding an alcoholic habit or feeding some, some form of habit like that. It's very, very rare that someone just gets into it purely for the money and doesn't have a habit or something they have to feed afterwards, but they have to have some kind of force driving them into crime. Sinead was introduced to pickpocketing 12 years ago. Since then, she has had a run of success and has never been caught. Some people are rare into this lifestyle. I'm not one of those. I actually come from a good family, I come from a good background. I do know right from wrong and I know what I do is wrong, but I have a drug addiction and I feel this is the only way I can make money quickly. I started shoplifting and then you go from shoplifting into dipping. You know, you're taking less of a risk because shoplifting, like, you can walk out and get caught easily. Whereas when you're just picking up people's purses and stuff, it's a lot easier, you know, and quicker. <laughs> you're getting money where you don't have to go selling clothes and selling stuff then. You're actually getting the money there and then. What happens is you start seeing people being really stupid with their bags and purses and they have them wide open. So it just went from being an opportunist. In street pickpocketing, there's three different types, if you like. The first level and the most easy level is an opportunist pickpocket. And they're just waiting for an opportunity. So it's more to do with the person being unaware of their belongings than it is to do about their skill. And then as the, as the person gets more and more skillful and they realise they can make money at this, they start to take a bit more risk and the skill level goes up a little bit and they become just a regular dip or pickpocket. And then they're kind of bumping into you. They might use an accomplice to pass the stuff off to after they dip you so they can't be caught with it. And they get a little bit more streetwise, they get a little bit more clever about what they're doing. And then the last level is known in pickpocket terms as a cannon, who is the, the big gun, who is the, the creme de la creme, very highly skilled and is able to take stuff from an inside jacket pocket, is able to unbuckle uh, a watch, is able to take a necktie, is able to take what any, nearly anything within reason. Um, and they're, they're the top level and they work in gangs of three, four and five. When they start off, they generally work alone. And as the skill level goes up, then they kind of bring in other people. The maximum number of people in a group of pickpockets would be five. Um, five people is enough to stand, surround someone while someone dips them, and that's all they need. So one person on each side and one person going for the, for the item, whatever it might be. Normally walking the streets, um, you would just meet opportunists, and they are the most uh, prevalent of the pickpocket gangs. Having been introduced to it in his early teens, 26-year-old Daniel makes all his money through pickpocketing. Years ago, we used to do it as kids and all, you know. Then uh, we started getting into drugs, realised that we could start making money from it. Going into town pickpocketing people. We make a lot more money now than we did back then. How come? Because you get all the iPhones and all now. They're very easy to rob. And it's a handy way to make money. Like, we could go and jump a shop counter and get played in six years, but... You can rob the same amount of money off somebody and get paid in six months, you know what I mean? It's a lot handier and it's, it's quicker to make money. Some days I could get a blade and nice dip to set me up for a week. Other days could be you two, three, four days a week. I only do this when I really have to. So it could be, I could do it for three months and the shot in a year and I might give it up then. 
and then I could do it for eight months of another year. I could do it for, you know, it depends. It depends on the state I'm in with my drug addiction because there's times when I really try hard to get clean and live a normal life. And then there's times where it could be out robbing like two or three times a week. Pickpocketing mainly happens in large venues where there's big crowds of people. So psychologically, a person's personal space gets smaller the more people there are around them. So if you're walking down the street on your own and somebody was on your shoulder and the street was empty, you'd notice that person straight away. If you're walking down a crowded street and someone is here on your arm and just behind you, you'll, you won't notice that person. Your personal space, you have that, that bit less attention. Um, where it happens then is at football games, big, any big uh, international events like that, where there's a lot of tourists around as well. And then last but not least kind of thing, more regularly but uh, less reported is probably outside nightclubs when people are drunk. And the reason it's kind of less reported is because people think they lost their item, they lost their phone, they lost their wallet. When in fact it can be that they were dipped. Just in town late at night, women coming out of pubs that night or out of clubs, they're often really vulnerable. Stick a hand in and get a couple of hundred quid in one go. Or on buses, you know, on buses, people leave their pockets hanging out. Around bank machines too. Just keep an eye on people leaving bank machines. Sometimes you can just be in the right place at the right time. Most of the time I would do it in shops, pubs and shops. In the pubs, people are dancing, they're leaving their bags, you know, on, on the chairs where they are. So I would just sit in there sometimes, letting on on one of the girls. And sometimes I wouldn't even have to sit in. Just walk in, lean over, pick up a point and pick up my bag. And they think that I'm just one of the pals. Then I go to the toilet, dispose of their stuff, and I take the money. Sanitary till bin, throw whatever you need in there. It'd be very rare that I do it on the road, unless it's like literally they're smiling at me saying, take me, take me, take me. But if it's not, I would mostly do it in the likes of clubs, shopping departments. It could be the toilet in a fast food restaurant. It could be anywhere. Dressing rooms is perfect. If you're in shopping and you're getting changed in the dressing room, there's a gap in between the two aisles of the dressing room. Don't just throw your bag on the floor, especially if it's open. A lot of people don't realise they're poor, so it'd be just sitting there because they're, they're focusing on themselves in the mirror. I know there's people waiting on someone to throw their bag down, and there's times I'm doing it myself. I'd be in there letting on that I'm changing. Well, sometimes I actually am shopping as well, you know. As I said, I'm an opportunist, so if something comes up, I'm going to take it. Sometimes I don't even go out to do it. Like, it just falls into my hands. They think they're safe because they're in a department store, but you're, you're safe nowhere. I'll get your purse if I want to. In terms of pickpockets, crews and that, they, the way they operate on the streets of Dublin today, there's, there's a mix of Irish nationals and foreign nationals doing it at the moment, um, in various gangs using various methods. In terms of setting the, the Irish pickpockets apart from the foreign national pickpockets, the Irish pickpockets tend to be more distraction theft and um, will eye up a person maybe at a bank link, they'll wait for the person and follow them and there'll be two together and they might go then when they have the opportunity. Um, the foreign national pickpockets work in much bigger gangs, fours and fives, and will be more likely to go for items other than cash that, to sell on the black market, likes of credit cards and that kind of thing. Pickpockets want to blend in as much as possible, but being a foreign national, they don't blend in with Irish people. I once saw a guy um, who I didn't expect was a pickpocket. It was after an Ireland-Italy match. He had an Italian flag wrapped around him, wandering around Temple Bar, and he was hugging people. So he was hugging people, celebrating the match, jumping around with them. And um, I realised very quickly that he was a pickpocket, and he was using the flag to wrap around people as he was hugging them. He had all the cover and all the time in the world to be working in the inside pockets. So during an international match, when Ireland play a foreign country, then they have the opportunity to pretend they're from that country, mix and mingle with people, and then they're dipping people in the process. I've heard of dips who take a wallet and straight away put it in a, a self-addressed stamped envelope and put it in the post box. That way, if they're caught, and if the guards grab them straight away, there's nothing on them, nothing that they can be brought in for, they can't be convicted, nothing. But two or three days later, the item arrives in their post. Do the guard concern you? Nah, just a bleeding occupational hazard. We do always try to have someone with me, so if we do get a dip, we just give it to them so they can get off soon for a while. Just in case we do get arrested, be out of the station within a few hours, be back up with them, have all the money, so nothing to be taken off me. I got the two years before, but I was out now a week, about a year and a half or something. 
never got caught by the police, never got caught actually dipping, you know. If you haven't been in trouble in a good long time, which most of the times I haven't, I'd, I've often had a good stretch of like four or five years where I didn't get caught. You'd normally get like, you know, probation or, you know, you might get a suspended sentence for a year. So you have to be good for a year or two. Hope I'm not jinx myself here, but I've never actually been caught dipping somebody. You'd be stupid not to be concerned by the guard. Like, we really don't want to be getting caught. <laughs> I don't want the humiliation of being, you know, dragged up the road, like in handcuffs and stuff like that. Like, I'd be mortified for my family as well as myself for people to see me in that situation. So, yeah, I am worried about the guards. And if anybody says they don't, I don't believe them, you know, unless they're brilliant at what they do and they've no fear of getting caught. After the break, Brian demonstrates how pickpockets operate. Here's how a pickpocket might do this, OK? Right. He might just bump into you yep. and then that's all it would take. While we discover what they're wearing to fit in. A lot of the time, it'll be the likes of us going around in suits and looking the pair that would be the biggest shoplifters and the biggest dippers. <laughs> The level of skill involved is quite high and um, people kind of um, disregard pickpockets, they see them as lowlifes but it's kind of a, a paradox, you don't, don't take them for granted, they are highly skilled and highly intelligent. Um, they do put a lot of practice into it and the more money they get, the more incentive they have to practice, so they will get better and better and better. Uh, there's a skill, some people are brilliant, you know, like I would only say I'm average. But I know some people who are unbelievable. Like, they take your watch off your arm without you even knowing. You know, some people really are good at what they do. I wouldn't be that good. Attempting to make more people aware of how easy it is for pickpockets to operate, Brian takes to the streets to demonstrate their skills. I'm Riley. Riley. Riley, where are you from, Riley? I'm from South Dakota. US? South Dakota. Yeah. Thanks. From the middle of the US, all okay. the way to Dublin. First off, what have you got in your pocket here? This one? Oh, the inside pocket. Yeah, grab what's in the inside pocket in here. That is actually a pocket watch. A pocket watch. A very, very fancy pocket watch. Riley, do they all wear them in America, do they? No. This is a fa very, a very fancy. Just me. Pop, the, pop the pocket watch back inside. We just yeah. dropped that in there. So it probably would be valuable for a pickpocket to bump be. into you. In yeah. the outside pocket down here, what do you have? The outside pocket. Change. Not change, just change. change. Just spare change. And on the inside pocket here, um, zip wise, pens. pens. There's, a, there's a pen. Yeah, not Just much. pens, not yeah. much, not there's much There's a pen in there and that's it really, yeah. Just a pen. And in the pants pockets in here, the pants I pockets. I keep nothing in there. Nothing in the pants pockets no. at all. Look, here's how a pickpocket might do this, okay? Right. He might just bump into you yep. and then that's all it would take. First off, you had, what did you have out here? In these pockets here? This one? Yeah. This, is your... this was my camera, and this is my wallet. Your wallet? Does your wallet look a bit like this? It does, and that's, that's very impressive. Yeah, you don't lose that camera either. Like your tie is just a bit crooked there. We've got oh, the tie. We've got to make this look good for TV, you know what I mean? Make there this you look go. good. How's that feel? That? Yes, very good. Okay. Okay. Fix your collar there. I didn't oh. get the watch. I said I didn't want it. In case I dropped it, it'd be too, oh, way okay. too expensive. Would you so check it? I did unzip, but I nearly. But I thought if I dropped that, it's going to be too expensive. Yeah. You're happy you have everything now. You've got wallet, watch, zip it up, zip it up. Before you go, Riley, you're your tie, dude, your tie. Oh my god. <laughs> so you have your phone in the outside pocket, you have your phone, and do you have anything in these pockets? No. Nope. No, throw the phone back inside, and I'll show you basically how a pickpocket works. And apart from these, actually, on the inside of your jacket, do you have anything on the inside no. of the pocket, not like a blazer? No, and the outside pocket here, and do you have a pants pocket? No. No? I'm very afraid, yeah. That is <laughs> <laughs> There you go, you're going to want to call someone about that. Is there inside pockets in the jacket, not like a blazer? And what about these pockets here? Do you have uh, anything in the pockets here? Just, just a 10 cent Just a 10 cent coin, yeah. just bits and bobs more than anything, right? Yeah. And, uh, and this side of the pocket in here, and there's no there's no inside pockets, which is strange. Yeah. And do you use your pants pockets at all? Pickpockets call that the candy pocket, did you know that? No, As in candy from a baby. Yeah. If you have an inside jacket pocket, or even in here is the best place to keep it, all close right. your body behind the jacket, close yeah. like this. Even on that side would do, okay? Yeah, yeah. So first off, First off, we wanted the phone, isn't that right? Yeah. So the phone, all you got to do is ring your friend. You might want to ring him there. Tell him about what's just going on. <laughs> no. No. Does it say to me there? No, maybe you want to go to the bank link, buy yourself a new one. You might need this wallet. Ah, there geez. you go. We got, the, we got the bottle of water out of your bag. And we got the phone. Look at that, the phone. Oh, Perfect. that's the phone. Jesus. Not only did we get all of that, but I've now robbed your identity because I have your bank statement. <laughs> <laughs> what's your first name? Simon. Simon. Nice to meet you, Simon. Before we start here, normally a pickpocket would mark you and know where the wallet is and that kind of thing. So just give us a rough idea. Do you have anything in the outside pockets here? No. No, very good. That's the candy pocket. 
pockets. Never leave it in the outside pockets. On the inside pocket of the jacket, nothing no. there. And here, nothing very good, close to the body. On the inside pocket in here, the telephone. And on the outside pocket down this side. Wallet. And you can see where you have three pockets on this side. Yeah. Here you have three pockets on this side of this jacket. Oh, on that side. You don't I have do three actually, pockets. Sorry, but you do have three pockets. Is there anything in these pockets? Uh, yeah, sorry, no, your tie no. is just coming up. Very much. I just want this to look good for TV. There we go. How's yeah. that? Okay. Yeah. So, so in, sorry, the, the three pockets here. Yeah. And would you normally have anything in those three pockets? Uh, my phone, the one you've just taken. The one, yeah, yes, the phone yeah, I just yeah. uh, the phone I just took. Too smart. Yeah, too smart. <laughs> too smart. But you know what? In the wallet, then you would have the wallet is the is the yes, one I would yes, go for. Yes, the wallet that's is the it. one. Turn around to be here, sir. We'll give you your wallet. Thank you very much. We'll give you your phone yeah. back, of course. We'll have, have to say, give you back your phone. That, that was quite excellent. Uh, I didn't realise that either had been robbed. Have me. you got everything on you now? I doubt it, I doubt it, but there you there, go. Are you happy you have everything? <laughs> Just sure last but not least, sir. Last but not least, your yeah. tie, sir. Your tie. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Bring the tie back. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, what a pro. Well aware that appearances can be deceptive, Sinead relies on her respectable exterior to aid her role as a pickpocket. Because I don't look like a typical shoplifter or drug addict, I tend to get away with it. People think you're honest. People don't, you know, it's like this labelling thing. If you walk around in a tracksuit, you're seen as a scumbag and a robber and a shoplifter or a junkie. You go in in a suit and people think that you're, you know, a professional. We <laughs> tag it and get the off fella with a wallet and that. Well, women more so because bleeding. If it comes to it, they're not going to put up a fight, you know what I mean? The Americans now that come in, uh, the foreigners basically, the same, most oblivious to it. They always seem to be the easiest. They're over here having a good time. Probably don't expect to get pickpocketed. You get some of them that are with. Like, some of them do have like pants, you know, like uh, safety pants in their pockets. You can't get into them now, but most of them wouldn't have a clue. I never hurt people. You know, I never go out and hurt someone. Even if a female or a male caught me doing what I was doing, you know, I wouldn't punch out or... Like, obviously, if they attack me, I'm going to have to defend myself. But I will try to intimidate them by shouting and screaming, like, saying, you know, you come near me and I'll fucking kill you, or whatever. But it would be the last straw for me to actually, you know, take a swing or a dig at somebody, because it's just wrong, and I know that. I know it's wrong what I'm doing anyway. But I have to live. Normally you carry a blade or something. Blades are the handiest for you know. Women with their handbags just shh, off with the strap and gone. If a big bastard came near me or something, I'd just whip my blade out and say, if you want to go over it, go over it. Just try and keep him back till he get away. Now don't get me wrong, they've often took me blades off and you bet me around before, but just what can you do? We'd never use it against a woman, right? There's no point. Just give her a slap. Just give her a slap and she'll fall and free. That's it. She'll fall to the ground in terror. Just go then. Go to the nearest taxi or whatever. Bring a mate, get a lift, you know what I mean? Uh, what about an innocent person? Well, if they're stupid enough to be going around with their bags open and bleeding, the opportunity's there to take it, then it deserves to be taken. Helen Egan has previously managed a busy Dublin cafe. During her time there, she witnessed pickpockets at work. Most people come to the conclusion that a robber is somebody of a lower class background, and indeed that is the case, but they're the people that stand out. In my opinion, there is two different types. I became very aware that there was also the other type, very well dressed, a person that you would not look twice at, a person that would come in and perhaps scope the place out, that would sit there and have a coffee and look around, look where the cameras are, look where the blind spots are, um, and then leave, and then come back again and basically prey on their target. People need to be a lot more vigilant. People come into cafes and they put their bags down beside them sometimes instead of, um, you know, under the table. You know, we're all guilty of it. After the break, a mugger shares his story. My first time would just be in about 16. Like, that's when I started on the heroin about that age. And reveals all his secrets. The people who I tag will be mainly tourists. Middle-aged women or people drunk coming out of pubs, coming out of clubs and stuff, you know. Since opening in 1997, tech security have aided the prosecutions of over 14,000 people. 
street crime that, that's taking place now is a lot more severe than years ago. You've got attacks, you've got fights, you know, you've got people that are, um, you know, being beaten up savagely. The CCTV that we put out on the streets, not all, always catch the crimes, but they do play a part in, in solving an awful lot of the big, big crimes. Some pickpockets graduate from non-intrusive street crime to more aggressive acts. With drugs as his motivation, 24-year-old Robbie has been making all his money from mugging people since he was just 16. I've been doing it, I'd say, about seven, eight years. My first time would just be in about 16. Like, that's when I started on the heroin about that age. We just ended up having to do it because my habit got that big. At the moment, I'm definitely doing it four or five times a week, at least. Depends on how much I'm getting out of them, you know? Like, sometimes I could get six, seven hundred euro a day. Or just let that last me a couple of days. And then once that's gone, you're straight out again. Sometimes you have to do it twice a day. Because you could do it, and then there'd be nothing in it, like, you know? There'd be nothing in the bag, like, so you'd have to go out and do it again. These are people that know exactly who has money, you know, like you know, people that are flauntatious about their, their clothing and their, their baggage and, you know, and, and all of these elements that, a, that a, a professional thief would look out for. They're not op opportunists. You don't just go for any person. The people who I tag will be mainly tourists, middle-aged women or people drunk coming out of pubs, coming out of clubs and stuff, you know. It's the people who have the money, basically. How can you tell if they have money? You can tell by their clothes. You can tell by the way they talk. You can just tell by looking at a person for a split second, you know? There's a million ways you can tell. With the women, the older the better. Well, in a certain age, you know, certain age groups, 30 to 50, say, it'd be the easiest. The older women don't seem to scream as much. They just sort of, they, they hand it over quicker. Like, I have done it to younger women before as well but they put up more of a struggle. The tourists, they're actually probably the easiest, really. For one, they have more money than anyone else. Like, I've got 3,000 euro off uh, an American woman one time. That wasn't even so long ago. Uh, see the Spanish students as well. They're another good target as well. We've only done a couple of men before and they put up a fight. You basically have to use violence with them, but it's never anything real severe. Any time I've had to show a blade or anything like that, people hand it over. I've never had to use anything. They always, always hand it over. Except for the one or two times you'd have to try to snatch. You know, to just snatch a handbag. Some people just don't let go and you have to swing them around just to get them to let go. I have got pretty violent with one or two. A woman I did, I uh, swung into a wall before and basically knocked her out. It's very rare, but you do, the odd time, have to use violence, you know? Does it ever stay with you after you've mugged someone? Yeah. Ah, definitely I feel sorry afterwards, you know? But then again, you just, you do it to get your drugs, get your fix, and then once you get it, you just forget about it. Muggins, uh, I mean, look, it can happen really anywhere, but in general, uh, it, it happens uh, in, in built-up areas, you know, your city centres. We go to an ATM. Well, stand across from an ATM machine. We'd be just watching for a certain kind of person at an ATM and then just follow them to an area where I know I can get away and basically just pull the blade out, just put the blade to them. You wouldn't go down on O'Connell Street or, or any lit-up area like that. you go to just some off-side street, you know? At night, it's the best, you know, with people coming out of the pub and club and all as well. People who are drunk and all, you know? They don't know what they're doing. Especially up around the posh areas, up around Harcourt Street, up around certain areas like that. You know that they're going to have some money on them, you know? We take everything. The whole bag, the whole purse, everything they have. They have all the best iPhones and all. Like, when I follow them from the ATMs, we get anything. We get 20 euro. It could be 500 euro. It could be anything. Then if I get an iPhone, 
would get another 200 euro for the iPhone straight away. And the credit cards. We'll just go to a fella and he take the cards off me. So basically get rid of everything that's in the bag, you know? Robbie's most successful bag snatch has made him over 4,000 euro. So as a street criminal, does it pay to be aggressive? There's days where, you know, like I got a nice few bob and I'm delighted with myself. I just think it's me birthdays all coming at once. You could get one dip and you could get like a grand. You could get 900, you could get 1500, you know. And then there's a time when you might get a fiver, you know, so it depends. If I get four, five hundred quid and like two dips or something, I'll go home. I'm not greedy, I'm not going to stick around, you know, and take a bigger chance. Well, I've been made over bleeding 800 quid straight in into a purse. Then the credit cards, I have another person I can give them to get a few quid for them, do you know what I mean? Just sell them off to another fellow who deals with all them. I wouldn't have a clue how to do it. I don't bother with the credit cards and stuff. I wouldn't go as far, like, I do know someone I can sell them to a fella if I wanted to, but to be honest, I couldn't be arsed. I just, as I say, dispose them in a sanitary bin or something, you know, a bin on the street. If I leave the premises, I would dispose of it in a bin on the street or something. I prefer to leave it in the toilets, though, so the lady in question can't find her belongings, whether it's, you know, her bag or all our credit cards, because there's nothing worse than losing all your credit cards and, like, other types of cards, you know? I know how much of a nightmare that is to lose them, so I would prefer to leave it there, their belongings, like, somewhere where they can be found. And it's only, you know, their money that I've taken. Street crime is rising, unfortunately. It's actually rising because the uh, uh, the criminality is just taking a, taking a, a, a new surge. Everyone's out robbing. Even people that gave up robbing years ago are back out robbing now, especially now with this recession. Everyone, we're desperate, you know? Our rents are getting cut, your labours are getting cut, children's allowance being cut. Like, how the fuck are we meant to live? I give anything for a job. I really would. I can't get a job because of my addiction. What happens to me is I'm walking away, I'm happy as Larry, I feel good, you know, that I'm being a good person in society. And what happens is somebody recognises me. And you're always recognised. Somebody always knows you and then they tell the rest of the employees that you're a drug addict. I'm getting on great with people until they hear this. And then within a week or two, I'd be laid off and I'd be told there's no work there. So then I'm just back to square one. You always just come up against a blank wall no matter how hard you try. If you had the option of having a job or to continue pickpocketing, what would you do? Unless the job pays as good as pickpocketing, but the minute we'd make more out of pickpocketing. Do you see yourself doing this for years to come? Uh, probably so, yeah. I don't think it's something we'll always do. Like, with the middle-aged women, we definitely say, like, nah, I'm not going to do that again. You know, definitely said that once or twice before. But then, like, when you have a habit, you do stupid things, like... I think it's something that, when I'm stuck, I'll turn back to it. If I need money, I will do whatever I have to do to get money. So I guess it is something I'll always go back to doing. A female needs to be so, so careful with her handbag. For females, if they want to avoid getting pickpockets, is most of the time they're getting dipped out of a bag. So a bag will probably open two ways. It'll have a clasp or a zip. The, obviously, the zip is better because it gives the pickpocket less or less time to get into it. And the other thing is, if it has a clasp that opens, always keep it in front of you and the clasp towards yourself. I know I'm putting myself out of work here, but a woman is better off having a handbag that has a zip with a flap that goes over it. And even if there's a buckle on that flap, brilliant. If you're walking around with a handbag that has like little strings or if it's like a little, um, little clip button, they're so easy to get into. They're so easy to rob. And if you're in shopping and you're getting changed in the dressing room, don't just throw your bag on the floor, especially if it's open. Because your belongings fall out and if it's there, you know, if there's a gap in between the two changing rooms, your purse is sitting there looking at me. God, I'm really putting myself out of business, but whenever. Males who don't want to get pickpocketed, they should be very careful. The most common place to put a wallet is in the back pocket. And in pickpocket terms, we call that the candy pocket, as in candy from a baby. If you're walking along and a pickpocket puts two fingers onto your wallet and stops moving, you will walk the wallet out of your own pocket. It's as simple as that. Um, the other way in a, in a crowded place is if they stand behind you, put their hand into your pocket and just raise, stand up on their toes, the, pocket, the wallet will come straight out of the pocket. 
So the back pocket is a, is definitely a no-go place for your wallet, if you're if you're anyway concerned. The best place for a male's wallet is the inside jacket pocket or anything with a zip. A zip. Don't leave it in a pants pocket or a back pocket. After the break, we explore the importance of self-defence. Knowing some sort of self-defence will affect your body language in a way that will make you much less attractive to a potential attacker. Derek Nally has been offering a support service for victims of crime in Ireland since 1983. In 2005, he set up the Federation for Victim Assistance with Mairead Fernan. Before 1983, when we established victim support, there was no assistance or help for victims other than to be witnesses in court when a crime was perpetrated. We found that there was a huge lack of support services for victims of crime in Ireland. We formed the uh, Federation for Victim Assistance in April of 2005. The Federation has grown considerably since it start, since started. What we do is we offer emotional and practical assistance to all victims of crime. Hi Emma, I'm Alicia. I'm from Federation of Victim Assistance. That's my auntie. Hi. How are you? Hi. And I'm Deborah, Alicia's colleague. Hi. Lovely to meet you. Hi. We would have had about 115 assaults last year, and that's quite a high number in relation to our overall figures. From the point of victims of street crimes, for example, mugging and handbag snatching and things like this, we have quite a number of victims would be either referred to us or would have re would refer themselves on. That can be reasonably traumatic, being attacked in the street and your handbag pulled from you and maybe knocked down, and dragged along if you decided to hold on to your bag while the assault was taking place. Our volunteers talk through what has actually happened to them and victims tell us that this helps them. You hear the story and then you listen. We're not there for ourselves, we're there for the victim. And the victim wants to talk and talk about it. So it's crucial that our people listen to them. So I hear you had a little bit of problem with a crime lately. I was getting off the bus, I was just going to meet my friend. I took a shortcut through one of the streets in town. Literally out of nowhere, two men, they just started demanding money. One grabbed me from the side and pushed me up against the wall. And I froze, I didn't know what to do. They are quite fearful. Um, they're certainly afraid of going out um, without having somebody with them for quite a long time afterwards. Uh, they feel embarrassed by it because quite a lot of them would feel guilty that it has happened, even though in most cases it would be unprovoked. And they are generally very shattered after it and sometimes quite injured. I have no scratches or, or scars or anything. It's just more mentally. I won't go anywhere on my own. and. I don't feel like I'm as confident as I was at all. I don't think I can trust really anyone. It made me very nervous as a person, which is completely different to what I was yeah. before the attack. Oh, that's terrible. It's awful if it's affecting all, every aspect of your life, you know? That's why I think it would, it would help you if you did report it. If you were nervous about making the visit to the Garda station, um, maybe one of us could come with you for moral support if you wished. Yeah, 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 that'll be, that'll be good. The point of the visit is that people go through various fears afterwards. They may be shocked. Quite a lot of victims feel they're actually OK. And then they find, maybe six months down the road, that they don't feel as comfortable in themselves or they don't feel as assured as they did initially. So it's really emotional support, a shoulder to cry on, more or less, and which a lot of people find very good. They find it a certain relief and getting it off their chest and things like this. Now sometimes it takes a little bit longer. Our visitors will have to maybe go two or three times over the space of a few months, but uh, normally one visit would do. We can leave those with you okay. uh, for now and I, I guess if you have a little think about what you'd like to do next um, and if you would like us to, to support you in any way in the next steps, just give that number a call and we'd be happy to to come and see it again. Trained martial arts expert Paul Duffy specialises in Krav Maga. Based in Dublin, Paul teaches the most modern form of self-defence to all ages and levels. 
So Krav Maga is just Hebrew for contact combat. So really it is the, the most tried and tested system of self-defense that we have right now. What Krav Maga is is what we call a reality-based system. So what I mean by that is we're not so interested in ring fighting or scoring points or com competitive type fighting. Our primary objective is basically protecting our safety. It's to avoid uh, violent confrontation in the first place, uh, to escape, and if necessary, we do uh, deal with the physical end of things, but always our goal is to escape. So we don't have rules in the way other martial arts do, you know, we don't have uh, no-go areas, we'll say, you know, blows below the belt, all that kind of stuff. Our primary objective is always to end the confrontation as quickly and as efficiently as we can, and from there to, to, to make our way to safety. What's great, in my opinion, about Krav Maga is that it works off the body's natural uh, instinctive reflexes. So with, for example, a lot of martial arts, say for example, you're being choked, um, they might teach some fancy defense where you lock in a hole and a, you subdue the attacker. And the problem with that is it's not very instinctive. Whereas Krav Maga, we look at, well, what will somebody do? In the case of a choke, what will they do anyway? Well, their natural reaction might be to grab the hands. But we say, well, if that's what they're doing anyway, then why don't we build on that and have that as the, as the foundation for our, our defenses? So all of our defenses are based on natural, uh, instinctive body movements, which what's great about that is it, um, it makes the system very easy to learn, very natural and very fast to learn, and also very, very effective. So the benefits of learning Krav Maga is that you know you're learning the most tried and tested system of self-defense that there is right now. Um, but aside from that, of course, it's a great workout. We go very intense. It's cardiovascularly very intense. Um, so you can usually see vast improvements in your, in your health and well-being as well. Aside from that, uh, one of the benefits that probably doesn't get enough emphasis is the sense of confidence that it gives to people. I think it's, it's crucial for some people to learn some form of self-defense. Now, I would advocate Krav Maga as the most effective form of self-defense. Knowing some sort of self-defense will affect your body language in a way that will make you much less attractive to a potential attacker. And that's been statistically and scientifically proven. There's a whole process known as the victim selection process, which basically comes down to your body language. And your body language, we know, is affected by your belief system. So if you go and learn some self-defense and you believe in its effectiveness, it will change you physiologically in such a way that you're a lot less likely to ever be attacked in the first place. Take, for example, a mugger. All things being equal, uh, who does he decide who, who he's going to mug? And by all things being equal, uh, let's say you're not carrying, blatantly carrying a laptop and an iPhone and all that. Or you've just got a sea of people and you need to choose who it is that you're going to attack. Well, what he does actually is how you carry yourself sends off subtle um, cues, basically subconscious cues, very, very subtle things that will make you more or less attractive to certain types of predators. So it's exactly the same as we have in the animal kingdom. We have it in the in the human world as well. So by changing your belief and by feeling that confidence that you do know how to defend yourself or that you have a fighting chance at least, it just makes you a lot less attractive. It takes you out of that attack funnel and makes you a lot less attractive to a potential attacker. So learning some sort of self-defense really as long as you believe in its effectiveness you know often you might think you've never had to use it but it has actually benefited you in ways that you didn't realize to me it's just a responsible thing for any uh, law-abiding citizen to do so for example you get a lot of people who invest their time and their energy into learning how to swim and it's it's not because they believe they're going to drown it's just because they want to be prepared in the off chance that something goes wrong while they're at sea but what I find strange is that not so many people are willing to invest that energy into learning how to protect themselves or learning what to do if something goes wrong on land, which is where they actually spend most of their time. So the majority of our students come here maybe have never been a victim of assault, but they recognize that it's a potential threat and they're just taking responsibility for themselves to make sure that they'll have a fighting chance. So a very common type of attack that a female might find herself in is a guy basically coming up from behind her, grabbing her from behind and pinning her arms. Maybe he'll try to lift her up, carry her off or take her somewhere. So the grab comes on. First thing, she makes a hook hand, five fingers, cross my hands. Now shifting your hips to expose my groin, she whips a few times, elbow, create the distance, two hands clasp and she turns out counter strikes, back of the head, knee, and run down, and escape. Basically what Rachel is going to do, she's going to hook her hands, she's going to control the, the grab with, with her left hand. 
From there, she shifts her hips to the side to expose um, Colm's groin. She whips into the groin a few times, creates some space between her, and, between her own body and Colm's body. From there, she uses her right hand to seal with the second hand, control both of his arms. She then turns her body out, and from there, she can deliver some counter strikes, maybe a knee, some punches towards the back of the head. She pushes Colm away, and she makes her escape. The kind of attack that you find yourself in is going to vary depending on the kind of attacker, the kind of situation you're in, the kind of environment. You could be in a bar, you could be in, a, uh, in the street, in your home, and, and so forth. You could be with somebody, a child, for example, that uh, limits your ability to escape. So what we do in our classes is we drill all of these different scenarios so that you can become familiar with them. So for that reason, I strongly, strongly advise people to take regular Krav Maga, regular self-defense classes. The perpetrators from tonight's program may have provided us with reasons for their actions, but these reasons cannot be justified in the eyes of the law and the people they attack. Although the occurrences of street crime are often unprovoked, if we are more aware of the perpetrators' existence in public places, we may limit their success stories.